as we are gathering in this space and online. Welcome to each one of you. Welcome you who are regular tenders, you who are visitors, welcome you in the pews and you who are, are watching and participating at home or wherever you may be. It's good to have you here. As we gather for worship, um, an announcement, several announcements. Um, those who are here are already aware, but um, executive committee made the recommendation that um, mass would be optional at this point. So <laughs> some of the pews have it, some don't, and, and know that you know, please do whatever is, is right for you. Um, but we do ask, especially those who are here, to continue to practice good hand sanitization and um, be mindful of where others are. As we gather, what other announcements do you wish to share? We have a, a smaller group here in the pews today. I suspect that may have something to do with the, the change in, in time. Um, Kudos to all of you who <laughs> were able to turn the clock forward. And it's good to see those who are still gathering. Just a reminder to board members, we have a board meeting on Tuesday and on Wednesday, uh, Jubilee ladies and other ladies of the church are having lunch at the Peach Tree at 1230. Hopefully you can join us. I did not ever put that in the bulletin, my, mis my bad. Thank you. I'd just like to mention that um, corresponding to our office manager, Michelle's decision to retire, we are advertising, looking for somebody to fill that position. It's, it's flexible, it's part-time, and if you know of anybody that might be interested in in learning more, um, please have them contact me or anybody to just say, um, check us out. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so this, this is actually news to most of the congregation that Michelle is retiring. <laughs> um. Well, the, the um, advertisement for the person has gone on to a, the um, website called Indeed. So as of today, people will be noticing that the um, position is available April. Okay. Yes, Michelle will be retiring at the end of April. Um, she has served us for 12 years um, and we'll um, have a way to, to celebrate her, but if you want to um, write cards or, or share anything, um, are you willing to receive them? Yeah. Yes, so Linda Giesman is willing to receive those and we will give those to her at once. Hi, I wanted to uh, say as part of Witness uh, Commission, Nancy McHaley and Chris and myself, um, we sent $875 in gift cards for the Afghan uh, Refugee Resettlement Program, and I sent it to Kathy Ruoff, who, who is a colleague of Nancy's, uh, a nurse, and she and her family members and two other friends decided to form a group for uh, uh, refugees who would be sent to the Lancaster area. They expected um, two adults and one child, and it's now up to 10 adults and, uh, and a baby on the way in April. So. Uh, I guess food stamps have not been received yet through the government and church world service, so these gift cards to Giant and Walmart will really come in handy. So thank you for your support in that. Uh, the other request is if you are inclined to donate to the uh, Ukrainian uh, refugees, we are at Ridgeway collecting um, donations. If you donate, uh, just write Ridgeway Church uh, for the check, and at the bottom on the memo line, put Ukraine. And when uh, $500 are received, Bob Hanna, our treasurer, 
we'll be sending uh, the uh, donation to Church World Service. And if anybody feels more strongly about another charity, uh, we're perfectly willing to send it that way too. So every $500 we'll send it. Oh, and um, also last Sunday when uh, the ladies made the soup uh, discussing the Ukrainian situation, uh, they decided to get money to them right away through this witness project. Uh, the money that would be collected for those of us who buy the soup, uh, they just immediately multiplied the number of quarts of soups and uh, we'll get that, uh, has already sent that to Church World Service. Yes, so there are several varieties of soup that are in the freezer in the kitchen. They're eight dollars each, and as Diane said, um, all the proceeds from that will will go to Ukrainian relief. Judy's not here, uh, so I'll speak up for nurture. There is a brunch um, next Sunday after church, and there's a sign-up sheet on the back. There is soup for sale in the kitchen. We made chicken corn. There's a sausage chicken stew. Eleanor's vegetable beef and potato soup, and there are also coconut eggs and East and um, peanut butter eggs in the kitchen. And the, the eggs are two dollars each. Yes. Are there any other announcements? Then let us fully prepare our hearts and minds for worship. <laughs> Please stand as you are able to for the call to worship. Come, people of God, to know again who you are. Return to the one who gives you life. Gather together all who are feel spent and discouraged, all who are weighed down in bondage and disheartened. How can we sing 
songs of joy and praise when there is no life in us. The word of God comes to us and hope is renewed. Life is restored to God's children. We welcome the winds of God among us, the spirit who offers life in all its fullness. God of life, present and promised. You are the one to whom we call, for you are the one who hears, and you are the one who acts, bringing us new life with your grace and love and power. Lead us in our time of worship, that we may be prepared to follow your lead in places where life is at risk, places where hope seems far away, places where dreams die during sleep. When we leave these walls, help us to live the teaching we proclaim within the place of worship. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. You may be seated. John 11 tells the story of the raising of Lazarus, but it is also the story of faith of his sisters, Mary and Martha, the power of a supportive community and the growing understanding among the disciples about how Jesus is and is revealed God's glory. Scripture is John eleven twenty five. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, he will live.
Sorry for the delay. Are we okay? Yeah? <laughs> Can you hear me? <laughs> John 11, verses 1 to 45. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed Jesus with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Lazarus was her sister. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. Jesus received the message. He said, this illness does not lead to death, but is to glorify God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, when he received the word that Lazarus was ill, he remained in that place for two more days. Then after that, he said to his disciples, come, let us return to Judea. His disciples said, Rabbi, they were just trying to stone you in Judea, and, and you want to return there? Jesus said, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Those who walk in the light do not stumble because they have the light of the world. But those who walk in darkness stumble because the light is not in them. And then he said to them, Our friend Lazarus is asleep, and I'm going there to awaken him. His disciples said, Lord, if, if he's asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, was talking about Lazarus' death, but they thought that he was merely asleep, and so Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And I'm glad that I was here so that you may believe. But come, let us go. Thomas, who was called the twin, said, let us go also, that we may die with him. When Jesus came to Bethany, Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, Bethany was not far from Jerusalem, only about two miles. And many of the Jews there had come to Mary and Martha to console them about their brother. And when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she got up and went to him. Mary remained in the home. When Martha came to Jesus, she said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. She said, I know he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And 
those who live and believe in me will never die. Do you believe this? And she said, yes, Lord, I believe. You are the Messiah, the the Son of God, the one coming into the world. And when she said that, she went back and told her sister Mary privately, Rabbi is here. He is looking for you. Then Mary got up quickly and went to him. The Jews who were with Mary, remaining there with her, saw her get up and go to go out and supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there, they followed her. Now Jesus had not yet come into Bethany, but was still in the place where Martha had met her, met him. And when Mary went to where Jesus was, she knelt at his feet and said, Poor me, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And Jesus, seeing her weeping, and the Jews who were with her also weeping, was deeply disturbed in spirit and moved. And he said to them, where have you laid him? They said, come and see. Jesus wept. And the Jews who saw said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus, again, greatly disturbed, said, went to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone was placed in front of it. Jesus said, remove the stone. Sure of the dead. Lord, already there's a stench because he's been dead for four days. And Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believe, you would see the glory of God. So they removed the stone. Then Jesus looked upward and said, I thank you, Father, for having heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I have said this for the benefit of this crowd here, so that they may believe you have sent me. Then he cried out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! And the dead man came out of the tomb, his feet, his hands and his feet still bound with strips of cloth and a cloth covering around his face. And Jesus said, unbind him and let him go free. And many of the Jews who had come with Mary and seen what he had done believed in him.
suspect that the scripture, the story that you heard and saw is one that's familiar to you. At the very least, the conversation that Jesus has with Martha, particularly his statement that I am the resurrection and the life, is one that resonates with you if you have been part of any Christian community. It's one that we hear in funerals and memorial services, a statement of faith that speaks to God who is present with us, God who gives us life through Christ Jesus, that though we mourn, we can have confidence that the one that we love is in eternal life and that we ourselves may experience it as well. But the scripture is not really about life in eternity. For those who were present, for those who were the first witnesses for this story and for those who were part of the first crowds who received John's telling of the story. It was not about life in the hereafter about what it means to claim life here and now. It is a story that begins with awareness of illness and a connection with sisters who are both friends of Jesus and who appear in several stories in scripture. We have this unusual situation of knowing their names, Mary and Martha, and not only do they appear by name in this story, but we have two other biblical stories. One that is also probably familiar from the Gospel of Luke, where Jesus comes to visit Mary and Martha to stay in their home, and Martha is busy making things right for Jesus, providing hospitality, preparing the meal, sweeping the house, and Mary, of course, is at Jesus' feet. In that story, there is this conflict about whether or not it is better to do the act of serving or better to listen as a disciple, something very unusual for women in that time. Jesus affirms Mary's choice, but it's Martha that he has the conversation with. The second story is the one that you just heard. And again, Martha is the one who has the conversation with Jesus. Although Mary was the one who sat as a disciple, Martha is the one who proclaims who Jesus is. Mary's only words are, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. The same words that Martha used, but as I envision it, there is a tone of some anger with Martha, awareness that Jesus could have acted, and, and why didn't you? And for Mary, it is just grief, just pure sorrow. The third mention of Mary and Martha is referred to in this story, but actually happens in chapter 12. Jesus comes to their house probably a celebration of Lazarus's new, renewed life. And it's there that Mary washes, or anoints Jesus and washes his feet with perfume and dries them with her hair. But perhaps that story was so shocking to the community that it preceded awareness of the story of Jesus raising Lazarus and so in the community who was listening to who were listening to the story the author of John gave this reference of what happened afterwards that's the same mary it is a story about life that is surrounded with grief lazarus their brother is sick and then died 
The disciples and Jesus are in another place because they had been threatened with stoning. The disciples are afraid to go back because they know that his, Jesus' life and maybe theirs could be on the line. They choose to stay. They would choose to stay where it is safe. Jesus chooses to stay until it is the right time. And maybe we can identify a bit with what does it mean to care for someone from a distance. Not threats of stoning, but over the last two years, we have certainly experienced what it means to be kept away from loved ones with illness, missing out on wonderful, nodal, changing moments of life, births and graduations and other celebrations, but also having to watch from a distance when those who we love are sick or even have been at a distance when those that we love have died, not even able to participate in the rituals of funerals and memorial services, of gatherings of any kind, we can identify with this story in a way that we might not have a few years ago. But when Jesus goes back and comes toward Bethany, he encounters these sisters who are strong in their own right, but also discover something that we also know well, that in times of grief and sorrow, tears, anger, questions, withdrawing into oneself and great expressions are all, all held with a community that supports. When we hear of deaths, when we hear of people who are ill, as a church, one of our first responses is to bring a meal, to go and be with those who are hurting, that ministry of presence, that when people are experiencing the struggle of death, to be surrounded with loved ones who care is an affirmation of life. It is an affirmation that when we are struggling, we are not alone. And so the Jewish members who came from Jerusalem to Bethany were representing the care of God even before Jesus arrived. And when he did arrive and had this conversation, this promise of life, and then as the whole crowd went to the tomb, they didn't know what to expect. But even in their doubt and their grief, they were curious or trusted that Jesus had something else planned. And of course, the end of the story is Lazarus coming out of the tomb. The story is about Lazarus, but doesn't, he doesn't have a single word in the story. In some ways, he is the tail end. The story is about life that appears in all these other places that when people are kept from life because of fear and because of grief, it is Jesus who speaks words of light and life. But at the end, when he calls Lazarus out, there's an invitation for us as well to think in this Lenten journey. As we are moving along toward Easter, what in us longs to have renewed life? Where do we yearn to experience resurrection? What lies dormant within us? Maybe it is returning to familiar routines. Maybe it is a sense that there are new beginnings, that life is not just anew, but renewed. And as you may have noticed, when Lazarus comes out, he's still bound. What binds you to what was? What 
needs to be removed so that you can be freed to live the life that Jesus has called you to live? Is it something internal? Is it external forces? People who try to convince you to to see the world the way that you did before when your eyes have been opened. One of the great gifts of faith, this promise of resurrection and life, as I said, applies to life hereafter, but the gift is also for here and now. How is Christ calling you into life right now? In this new space, in this new world in which we're living, where things were not quite the same as before, and we don't know exactly what they will look like. What gives life to you, here and now? The story ends in in one sense, continues on with controversy, but, but the author of John included this important piece that many of the Jews who were there, not to have this awakening, but came just to support Mary and Martha, but who witnessed John coming out of the tomb and being set free. They themselves believed. And I wonder in the unbinding of Lazarus, what new hope and new life did those witnesses experience in their belief. What of us today? Where do we find life? Where do we find life amidst sickness? Where do we find life amidst war and rumors of war? When peace seems shaky at best, Where do we see those glimpses of life? Yesterday, I was watching several videos on YouTube, and and one of them showed an image, a video of, of a woman who was a professional pianist, and her home had been bombed. And in the video, she wipes the dust off the piano, this beautiful white piano in the midst of all of this rubble, that somehow was undamaged and played. This hauntingly beautiful song, this song that it encourages life. When all around her is the, are these images of death and destruction. Her home is destroyed, she was going to have to leave, but she chose to play one last time in this space. We see as well images of sunflowers. Thank you, Beth, for the sunflowers and the bulletin board in the hallway. (laughs) I look forward to seeing it. Sunflowers are great images of of life that, that shine as not only Ukraine's flower, but serve an important role in pulling out radiation from the ground. Um, So in their very life, they are helping to restore life. They are not just opening people to see the brightness of the sun, but are taking away what kills. How can we hold on to that image of life? Life that is not just a reminder of the sun that shines even after snow and winter cold, but the Son of God who shines in us, who calls us out of our tombs, whatever they happen to be, who calls us out where we are too accustomed to death, to loss, to grief, and who invites us to be accepted fully for who we are as children of God, renewed, restored, embraced, and loved.
not your heart be troubled? You believe in God, believe in me. In my Father's house, I've prepared a place for you. Richard. God of life, from your breath we receive life, and when we breathe our last, we have faith that we return to you. You are with us in all of the breaths, 
and all the moments in between. The places of joy and celebration, but also in the places of grief and sorrow. Hear the prayers that we offer this morning, the prayer requests that have been named and the things that are on our hearts but not spoken. We carry heaviness, awareness of cancer diagnoses, those who are suffering losses, those who are facing unexpected and frightening times. We pray for healing. And we rejoice in healing, in good news for Meredith and for Angela. We celebrate those places where they are recovering, even as we pray for continued healing for them and strength for their families as well. We bring grief with awareness of the troubles around us, the troubles that seem to increase day by day. As we see rising gas prices, help us to be mindful of those who are struggling to just survive. For the, the strength of human spirit to overcome occupying forces to continue to seek out beauty in the midst of destruction. We pray for their perseverance and for their cries for freedom and peace to be heard, even as we join them. We pray for an end to fighting and destruction. We pray that you would soften the hearts of President Putin and others who support invasion, that they would see a different way and that those who are called to tables to negotiate might also seek a better way, that we would not continue in endless cycles of violence and retribution. Guide us into life, O oh God, life that we hold in a promise that is given to us in Christ Jesus. Continue to strengthen our faith and belief that regardless what happens to us, we are yours, that as we have come from you, we return to you, that in all that we have right here and now, help us to hold fast to the life that you have given us the gifts that we have around us, the community that supports us, the ways you call us to offer our gifts in response to others. Help us to hear and to care for all who are crying, all who are struggling, all who are suffering. Restore us by your mercy, O oh God. We pray these things in the name of Christ Jesus. Amen.
that's a song that many of us can't sing without crying. And it is so because it speaks to the power of faith, to the promise of hope, to a gift of life, even in times of sadness. So go forth. As we see snow around us, hold forth to the promise of spring that awaits. In the bitterness and the strife, look for flowers that continue to bloom. Go forth as people of God's love and grace. Receive the life that you have been given. Offer it in gratitude to others so that they too may see life blooming in and around each one of us as we go forth in the name of Christ. May it be so.